Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Folly. And school is back in session in the Saturday. Night. And we're going to go over podcast 1.1. This is time number two for me, I've got to tell you. I'm horribly mad because it crashed time number one. I tried the new better way, and it stinks. So I'm going back to my old original range. Um, and we'll begin from there. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between mixtures and pure substances. We're going to talk just a touch about measuring. And all you need to know about measuring is add a digit. Okay. And then we're going to talk a wee bit about separating mixtures, which might be some of the new stuff for you. So let's take a looky looky. Physical changes. So a physical change is a change in mass, meaning you cut it, right? Make it smaller. Change in shape, which means you just bend it. That would be like using a mold for it. Um, but not identity. You can do this by cutting it, boiling it, melting it, freezing it, or using a mold. It's still the same thing after the change. Okay, so now I'm worried because my computer crashed a minute ago that my power is going to run out now. So you get to hear the life story of me. All right. Chemical changes. Chemical changes change the identity after the change. So that means I might start out as bread. I just misspelled bread. Start out as bread. I'm changing the identity, and I end up as char. Ah, it's Freddy Krueger. He got burned like toast. Ah, right? Toasting. Yeah, toast. Okay. Change the identity after change. <coughs> it has a new formula. If bread has the formula, C, I'm making up the formula of bread, um, C, uh, 16, H, 35, O, 4, and then we find out that toast or burnt or char is carbon six plus hydrogen plus oxygen plus, I guess it's got to balance. Let's see what I can do here. C, ooh, 10, H33. And that's what you get. I'm making up C6, calling that char. Okay. So they have new formulas. Notice how this formula does not exist anymore. And that was totally made up. I hate using made up things, but you get the idea. Burn, die, precipitate, form a gas, change a color. All of those things are chemical changes because you have new substances. Okay. The trickiest one here is boiling. Boiling forms a gas, but it's not a chemical change. Because if I could boil bread, let's pretend you could, what I would start with is my made-up formula of bread, C16H35O4. And if I added heat to it, this starts out as solid bread. If I could heat it without it burning, so in an oxygen-free environment, I would get C16H35O4 gas. Notice that's not a chemical change because all I did was change the state of matter. Okay? Now, normally when you heat things like that, the oxygen will react, which is where you get the char, 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 char. But um, we said as an oxygen-free environment, it just turns into a liquid. Liquid bread or gas. Isn't gaseous bread just hard to wrap your mind around? Okay, pure substances. Elements, one type of atom. In a drawing, what that will look like will be X, X, X. Okay, and Xs are my elements. They can be diatomic, okay? So it could also be like this. I'm going to do O's for my diatomic ones. See how it's, whoa, man, that's pretty. See how I have the same size O? I'm telling you that because they don't really look that much. Can be diatomic. There's only seven of them. They are H2, O2, N2, Cl2, Br2, I2, F2. Those are the only ones that are diatomic. So when you have a double element like that, it's going to have, it's got to be one of these seven. Okay? So it's Honkelbrith is how I remember those. And those always, are they're never by themselves. Like I can say, hey, look, there's an iron atom. No, that can't happen if I'm looking at oxygen. We know we breathe O2, right? Nobody breathes O. O doesn't exist, right? What happens is it finds the other nearest O, and they just form O2. That's the way they kind of roll, okay? Does that kind of make sense? I hope. If not, you can remember it, I promise. Compounds are more than one type of atom. So what that means 
is I might have, here's my container, I might have X with O attached. Okay, more than one type of atom. Now, more than one type of atom, but it has to be bonded. And how do I represent bonding here? They have to be touching. Oh, isn't that cute? Max has himself a little special friend. And how can you tell? They're touching, they're holding hands. Oh, isn't that special? Oh, it's so adorbs. Right? So if they're touching, they're bonded. Okay? Not a combination of properties. Okay, so it's not a so notice these compounds are not a combination of properties. So if I think about hydrogen, I'm only gonna talk about water here. Hydrogen explodes when you put a match to it. Oxygen burns when you put a match to it. H2O extinguishes, I wish I picked a smaller word, extinguish is. That's new. That's not a blend. Okay? If I breathe hydrogen, my voice is very high. If I breathe oxygen, my voice is very norm oh, normal. If I breathe water, my voice is very garbled, right? Garbled. I think garbled's a word. I'll go with that. All right. Um, NaCl, the same thing kind of happens, but you don't really know the properties of sodium or chlorine, and I want to keep this short for you. Mixtures. Any state of matter. In any state oops, of matter. Is possible. Okay. So what that means is I can have a solid in a solid. I can have a solid in a liquid. Okay. I can have a gas in a solid. Any of them. They all work. Okay. A homogeneous mixture. The absolute synonym is a solution. I know we talk about solutions being a solid and a liquid, like a, a salt water solution or a saline solution in a hospital, but anything that is a homogeneous mixture can be called a solution, okay? And anything called a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Every sample has to be the same, okay? So that's, homo means same. And the key part here is every sample is the same. Sample is the same. Sample is the same. That's what you need to know about a homogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous, hetero means different. Samples are different. Samples are different. Samples are different. And I can do these like big things that work together, but really um, living things are hetero on a microscopic scale. And the reason why I say that is when you look at it, Remember how you'd have um, like, oh, look, this has a cell wall and it's got a nucleus and it's got the, what's that one that looks like a hot dog that gives it all the power? Yeah, I know. You're saying it out loud. You're saying it out loud. It's the powerhouse of the cell. It's the, it's the mighty something. Okay. So all of these things, you're not going to be asked them on a mac macroscopic scale. It won't be a word. It's going to be a picture like this. Okay. So this is going to be a pure element. Pure, there's only circles. That's why it's pure. It's an element because there's only one type, and that would be a circle. And it's a gas because it fills the box. Okay. Now this one, notice how I can draw the line right here. It's a heterogeneous mixture, okay? This hetero part, remember the samples are not identical. Okay, so the samples are not identical. So whenever I have layers, that means the samples will not be identical. Layers equals heterogeneous because the top is different from the bottom. Does that make sense? I hope the top is different from the bottom. Um, and it's a compound. Why is this a compound? Well, this is an element. We talked before how it's an element. It's one tip, one type. And a compound, this is my compound, right? And it's a compound because it has two different types, big circle, little circle, little circle. And they have to be touching, which is bonded together. Okay? This one, homo or hetero, this one is your 
discussion question. There's not really a right answer here. Um, it is really one where if I told you the way AP Chemistry likes to do this, and I like to do this too, I would say that Ana Lucia says this is homogeneous. Why would she say it's homogeneous? And you would say the samples are equal. Now, real these are real measurements, right? So it's like, eh, well, if I count this, I've got one and a one, and it's uh, divided a little bit. So it's close enough to being identical, okay? But what if I said, no, 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 Michael says it's heterogeneous. Is he wrong? Well, it, it, not is he wrong. If it just said Michael says it's heterogeneous, why? Why would he say that? Well, why do you say anything's heterogeneous? You would say it's heterogeneous, I, since I have it here, because the samples are not identical, right? When you get down to be super nitpicky. So I just want you to know that AP chemistry will often give you an answer. You're not allowed to say, no, uh you just have to explain why one would say that is true, right? Um, F is a pure compound. No, E is a pure compound that's a solid, and your compound, again, is a Mickey Mouse, right? Big circle, touching, bonded to little circles. Um, that is a pure element, again, but it's going to be a solid pure element because it's on the bottom. Um, G is a pure diatomic element. That's not a compound. These are the same. So element, diatomic element, but element. If I did this, that's a compound because different parts. And then note how hard it is for a teacher to ask you to draw a homogeneous sample because this is iffy on its heterogeneity or homogeneity. So it's really hard to do, okay? So just note that's difficult. So it's probably not gonna be asked. How to measure. How to measure, add a number, okay? All instruments have a numbered, unnumbered, and an estimation. You think estimations are guesses. They are not. They are not guesses, not guesses. No, 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 no. Max crashed his car. Ah, Max crashed his car. He got an estimate for the damage and it was $3,700, right? Could the guy come back and say, I'm sorry, it's $13,800? No, he can't. An estimate is a real number that has value. $3,700 estimate means it's probably going to be $3,600 to $3,800. Right? An estimate is an approximation that has meaning and value. If I were to put a dot right here, boop, 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 this would be 5.5.2. Oh, my dot disappeared. Isn't that a dirty dog? Oh, you dirty dog. Now my dot's back. 5.21 or 5.20, right? But you need that extra last digit, okay? So just know you have to add one if you're really measuring it. Um, digital, the last digit is estimated. So that means this says 0.00, .00 which means if the actual value was 0 0.01, this balance is doing its job. Okay, An estimate is good within the wiggle room of that last digital digit. It won't flutter like that. That's it. Separation by distillation. Um, this is separation by boiling point. Boiling point is based on self-attraction. Okay? So if I'm very attracted to myself, very attracted to myself, I won't boil. If it's less attracted, it's going to be what boiled first. Okay, so what happens here? I've got two things in here. I've got blues and I've got purples. Okay? Purples are not very attractive. So if you put energy into the purple, that energy is enough to turn it into a gas. And this gas should all be purple. I'm colorblind, so I hope these are all purple. So these are purple lines that come up, and then you cool it down and recondense it. So you're left with pure purple here. And by the way, and that pure purple would be weak bonds. That's how you can identify it. And in here, you're going to be left with pure 
blue, which by the way would have the stronger bonds. Right? So this won't be a surprise to you. There were two people in my classes today that said they didn't come to school because they said it's too hot. Okay? Are those weak people or strong people? It's too hot, I can't go to school. They're weak. They're weak, 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 weak people who didn't come to school. So they were separate. They separated themselves and they stayed home in their sad, happy little air conditioned lives that I was jealous of, right? And the rest of us were strong like bull, strong purple, we are blue ones, strong bonds. We went to school and we stayed together. Yeah. Separation by filtration, um, separation by particle size. Um, you should be able to draw something where you've got holes on a filter and something like this. And then the question will be, can this pass through the filter? And you use your great knowledge of talking like a little baby Chucky. And little baby Chucky would say, the square can't fit through the little holes. So the filter would catch the square, but it would let my little dots go through because the dots are smaller than the holes. And that's it. No need to learn the vocabulary word of retentate and permeate and feed. None of that's necessary, but you need to be able to analyze a picture of filtration, which I think you could have done um, before I showed that slide. I hate that we taught chromatography. It is such a sixth grade science project that it drives me insane, really a fourth grade science project, but it's on the AP exam. So separation by chromatography, which is separation by polarity, and polarity right now means chargedness. If you're more polar, you're more charged. There are two types of substance, colon. Polar is number one, and nonpolar is number two. There are rankings of it, but we're going to just go with this. Kind of like there's two types of people, ugly and beautiful. Now, there's different layers of ugly, right? And there's different layers of beautiful, but you get there's a continuum, but there's two types of people, ugly and beautiful. And we're all beautiful at LT. So, And the ugly ones go to Hinsdale Central. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. Polar has charges and will stay with other polar things, right? The pretty people will stay with pretty people. We're staying at LT because we're pretty. Polar paper means the polar parts move slower. So if this is polar and it's polar paper, it's going to stay with it because the pretty stays with the pretty, right? But if you have a polar solvent, and my polar solvent moves through here, right? My polar solvent is moving. So... If there's a bunch of pretty people walking by you and you're pretty, you join in the pretty walk, right? And remember, the ugly people of Hinsdale Central just wa watch us with jealousy, okay? Polar paper means the polar parts move slower. Polar solvent and nonpolar paper means the polar parts move faster, okay? You can't tell what they're going to use without them telling you, okay? But these are the two choices, okay? So what happens is you get a beaker with a solvent in it. And it starts off like right here. And just say it's water. It can be any solvent, but just say it's water. And this is my original dot. Now water's polar, so it's going to come sliding up here. And water's going to climb up this paper by capillary action. You don't need to know that word, but some of you are dying to say it because you took bio a good biology course. The water made it all the way up here. This dye is not as attracted to water. At, you know, it's just not perfectly attracted. So the water top line is up here, and this is trying to catch up because it loves it, but it's not very far. If I had something here, this would be less polar. So this is less polar, and this is more polar. Remember, water, which is polar, is my example here. Okay? So given time, it will separate that way. And we'll do way more with this in class, okay? When you measure it, it's like, well, where do I measure it? Do I measure the leading edge? Do I measure the trailing edge? Do I do the middle? Um, we're going to measure the farthest that the dot goes. This you've never heard of before. This is thin layer chromatography. It's exactly the same as the chromatography you did with the what ink pen killed the teacher story, right? Only there's a thin layer on a sheet of plastic. The tin layer is typically silica, which is very polar, or alumina, which is also very polar. I don't think you need to know that it's specifically silica or alumina. You just need to know that the 
layer is very polar. And what's weird about thin layer chromatography is you can use UV lights to see the invisible spots. This is what makes thin layer chromatography useful and unique. Okay, not everything that moves you can see. Not everything has a color. Okay. And then you can react the moving dyes with ninhydrin. Again, I don't believe you need to know the word ninhydrin. So when I put it in quotes here, you can just say stuff. Okay. The layer is typically stuff that is very polar or stuff that is very polar. Right. You can react the moving dyes with stuff to see them. Right now, I'm guessing this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. So let's take a look at an example. M, this is M, is the sample. We don't see anything on here. These are different amino acids. We don't see any of them because we didn't spray it with ninhydrin. Okay? So remember, thin layer chromatography, the different things are going to move. Um, the things that are um, most polar here. And the things that are least polar here, I misspelled least. Okay. But we can't see them because they're only visible in the UV spectrum. So we spray it with ninhydrin, which lets us see them. Oh, okay. This is thin layer chromatography, and this is what it looks like before ninhydrin, after. M, this is the letter M. It's just, it doesn't stand for anything. It's just what I found on the internet. It said M there. What amino acids are in M? Okay, here's little baby Chucky. Well, let me tell you, this is M. Well, this one looks like it matches up. But this one's in there, so number four is in M. And this one looks like it matches up, but almost, I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to say, yeah, I think number one, too. This one right here, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. That's not one. That's not one at all. And this one right here, it, it's close, but I think it's a different color. So it's not that, not that one, not that one. And then these, I think they're the same. I think that'll work, too. So I'll do four, one, and five because they match up. I'm very good at telling what matches. They're the same color, and they're they're very, very, very much the same place, too. But it's a little different, but it's very close. Many graph analysis things, if you think like you're a four-year-old excited little kid, you'll get it. I call that little kid little baby Chuck. Column chromatography. Again, all we're talking about is how much does it love the polar? You have silica or aluminum gel in the burette. Remember, you don't need to know exactly what they are, but you need to know they're very polar. So there's polar stuff in here. This is polar. So think sticky goo. There's steel wool at the bottom to make sure it doesn't go out. Glass, they call it glass wool, but steel wool is what makes sense to us. We've seen that before. So this, if I add something to it, if I keep adding the new solvent, so I have something I want to separate. So I have a mixture of um, water and uh, chloroform. You don't know what that is. That's good, chloroform. And you want to separate it somehow or another, okay? So it still has solvent and it's going to separate. So what happens is I keep flushing the stuff in here. I put my mixture in here and I'm going to keep running water in. So I'm going to keep adding water. Let's just say water is my, my solvent. Keep adding water. And what's going to happen is these will eventually separate out. Okay? So you keep adding new solvent. So remember, this is polar. So this is the most polar. And this yellow is the least polar. You could also say most nonpolar, and either one of those will work. Now notice I've separated. I now have yellow separate from blue. Okay? Physical changes stay the same thing. Chemical changes change the identity. No distillation, chromatography, and filtration. Um, elements, compounds, and mixture by picture. Touching is a bond. Oh, I'm holding your hand. We're tight. We're a little friendly. How great is that? <laughs> I will say toodles to y'all. I hope that finishes my... Uh, uh, should stop. So long.